Okay. We're going to go ahead and get started. I'm sure there will be a, a few more people joining us uh, as we get started at the top of this hour. Well, thank you everyone for joining today's webinar. You can see the uh, the title there. We have two wonderful speakers who have kindly volunteered their time this morning or afternoon, wherever you're at, to share with us uh, some new developments that uh, that will certainly be of interest to many of you in, in the community. Uh, my name is John Cadiz, and for those of you that have attended these webinars before, some of these slides are um, pretty routine to you. But um, for those of you that may not know, um, the, the work that you're going to be hearing today is from two scientists who were or are part of the Human Islet Research Network. And this is a pretty large um, investment that NIH made almost a decade ago, um, really with two aims, trying to understand why and how human beta cells are lost or attacked in type 1 diabetes, and then really what are the strategies or the uh, prevention therapeutics that can be used to try to address that. And that's reflected in the organization of HERN which wasn't always like this. So in other words, when, when NIH made this in investment and envisioned a modular network where as the science led us, uh, certain modules could be swapped out. So this is the current evolution of HERN. And what you can see is you can see different themes in the networks. And each one of these represents large groups of individuals working together to try to answer a series of questions. But this isn't a closed network. Over the, the last nine years or so, there have been opportunities for investigators who weren't there at the beginning to actually become members of HERN. And so NIH periodically releases um, RFA opportunities to come into HERN, but also there is money that is given to HERN to bring in um, new work, new science, new talents, um, and then there's other opportunities as well, too. And so all of those you can access from our website. You can also follow the different developments that happen in, in HERN if you're interested in job openings in a particular lab or other funding opportunities. We have a newsletter. You can sign up to uh, uh, get that newsletter. It comes out monthly, but it's all cataloged on the website as well. We have several different uh, resources. Many of these bullet points we've presented before as a webinar, so you can always go back and check those out as well. And then, of course, we have a different uh, a number of different channels in which you can follow us as well. So all those resources are available to you. And you don't have to worry about what you hear today. It is being recorded. We'll uh, shortly after today's webinar, we will post it on our YouTube channel so that you can um, watch it again if, if things uh, come up. So here is the here is the topic. So we're going to actually learn what a ProTac is today and um, learn a number of different other uh, items. These are some reminders. Please try to keep the disruptions down. But the way we're going to do this is we have two speakers, and I'm going to introduce the first speaker to you. But at the end of that first speaker, we're going to open it up to, to Q&A. And then again, at the end of the second speaker, we're going to do these. And the reason why we put these webinars together is not just to show what is actually going on in HERN, but these are wonderful opportunities to connect with other investigators um, for projects that you see might be of interest. And these are all speakers that are willing to interact with you, share the technology, share the protocols, share the research. And so this is a really open, uh, this is really open science. Um, so what I'm going to do as I'm going to switch off is I'm going to introduce, I'm going to stop sharing my screen, and then Dr. Bridget Wagner is going to come on and share her screen. And let me briefly introduce you to Dr. Wagner. She's been a uh, lifelong Harvard alumni, I would say. She got her bachelor's and her PhD degree both at Harvard, uh, moved on to the Broad Institute, where she currently directs the pancreatic cell biology and metabolic disease team. She has her own team, of course, and she leads a large group of investigators. And I guess I, I, guess I would call Dr. Wagner and, and also Dr. Shotney 
um, probably drug discovery scientists. You can correct me. You can correct me um, if I'm wrong. And Dr. Wagner also leads the uh, Hearn Trans Network Committee. So that that's a body that has been organized to try to help organize Hearn a, a little bit in those things. So Dr. Wagner is a great resource, and I, I really look forward to her talk and Dr. Shudri's talk that will follow um, thereafter. Thank you, Dr. Wagner. Thanks, John. Um, great introduction. Thank you very much. And, and I'm pleased to see a few people on. That's great. We'll, we'll get started and talk about bifunctional small molecules. Uh, the way we've divided our tests today, I'm going to give a, a high level conceptual overview, not so much uh, chemistry. So hopefully it'll be quite accessible to, to the, you know, people in the lab. Um, and then I will uh, go ahead and uh, introduce my colleague, Amit Chowdhury, and uh, he will describe some of his very exciting work in, in bifunctional small molecules as well. And, um, you know, get, get more of a, an overview of, of the primary literature that he's been um, contributing. So great. So we'll start with, um, turn on my laser pointer and go to our next slide. So to start, um, most of you hopefully know of uh, classic small molecule inhibitors. This is the dogma we're taught, you know, in our chemistry and biology classes. You have a non-covalent <clears throat> inhibitor of a particular protein of interest, usually an enzyme, uh, binds to the active site and causes reversible inhibition. Kinase inhibitors work this way. You know, many of the compounds that you might buy from Sigma, very frequently they act in this fashion. Protax, however, are a whole other beast. These are uh, proteolysis targeting chimeras. And they're composed of, of three different components. The, the blue here represents a, a cartoon of the protag. First, you have a small molecule that binds to your protein of interest. That is linked to another warhead uh, compound that binds to uh, something that is recruited, typically in protax and E3 ubiquitin ligase, and then a linker that combines the two. You can really, in a simplistic way, think of it as a, a dumbbell kind of molecule. When you bind your protein of interest, again, you, you form a ternary complex between the protein of interest and the ubiquitin ligase, and then the, the machinery that comes in to cause polyubiquitination of your protein of interest and degradation. I show in the bottom right, just for your edification, um, some key reviews so that if you want to learn more of the details around these areas, you can uh, go ahead and, and take a look at those. Um, the PRODEC is liberated and allowed to then uh, recirculate this process. And that catalytic mechanism of action is a very strong advantage of, of PROTEX. So this is conceptually how, how they work. Now, why I mentioned one of the region, reasons that's quite uh, advantageous, catalytic mechanism of action. Some other reasons that these, this is an advantage, your target binding ligand need not be an active site inhibitor. And this opens up then a panoply of options in terms of we can inhibit, uh, degrade rather, transcription factors, things that, that would typically in chemical biology, they use the word uh, undruggable, which you know I don't love. I, I prefer the term not yet drugged. <laughs> um, but the idea that uh, non-enzymatic targets can be uh, degraded by this process as well. Uh, the target is completely destroyed. This is important because there've been actually some head-to-head uh, -head comparisons with enzymatic inhibitors. And oftentimes these enzymatic inhibitors can actually um, cause a compensatory increase in the expression of the target. And, uh, and also analogs that, that might have a, an, another compensatory mechanism on the cell. In this case, you know, by, by completely destroying the target and, you know, proteolytically, uh, those things don't happen quite as uh, frequently, it's found. Um, and then finally, the ternary complex formation itself between your compound, your protac, your protein of interest, and then the E3 ligase, allows for greater selectivity. So these compounds um, have less of a chance of wreaking havoc in the cell. Of course, there are challenges. Finding the right linker. You know, we always put this in as, you know, kind of a black box. 
there's a whole field of uh, medicinal chemistry that, that is becoming to be known as linkerology, um, which involves finding the correct linker. And the reason for that is, you know, we, we characterize these compounds as dumbbells, but really they're kind of, they fold on themselves. You got to make sure that the protein of interest and the E3 ligase come together in a ternary complex that, that enables ubiquitination. If that orientation is reversed, for example, there might be no opportunity for the E3 ligase to have its effect. So the, the composition of the linker is very important. Um, another minor, but you know, significant challenge is um, these molecules, they call these small molecules, but they end up being quite large sometimes. And um, there can be issues in terms of um, penetrating the cell membrane. So um, a lot of work is being done in that area as well. So that's on the, the, the strategy itself. Um, where do we get these E3 binding warheads? Um, the very beginning of, of development of these Protex, it started as more of a um, peptidic compound. And it was several discoveries over the last 20 years that really enabled the, the emergence and now explosion of small molecule-based Protex. Um, one example I'll tell you about here is uh, lenalidomide. It's a, a drug and we're very closely related to thalidomide, and it's used for multiple myeloma, but, and it's very effective, but for decades, it was not known exactly how this, this compound worked. And in 2014, a group, uh, several groups uh, published together in science and found to their great surprise that uh, this compound actually binds to the cerebron E3 ligase, and causes the degradation of transcription factors, um, the Icarus transcription factors, IKZF1 and 3, and this enables the, um, the anti-cancer activity of this compound. But of course, you know, the chemical biology field, when they saw this happen, thought, oh my goodness, now we have our, a, a potential warhead that binds to E3 ligases that can enable um, more of these compounds to be made. And so the race was on, you know, trying to find other warheads that might bind to other E3 ligase, VHL, for example, um, uh, went on. And so now it's, it's really a very, very, very active field in the pharmaceutical industry and, um, and in chemical biology generally. Uh, as I mentioned, the, the Protac field is roughly on the order of about 20 years old, where the first Protax were found to be peptidic. And this is a timeline showing that, uh, you know, some of the first small molecule Protax were developed in the mid aughts. And um, as the, the, the field is growing exponentially, of course, now we're looking at, at and towards the, the current era, that many of these compounds are entering uh, different phases of drug development. So it's uh, becoming a huge field. And again, this, this is a great review of, of Protax generally. My point here is that it's not just an academic exercise of here's a cool tool that you could use in the lab. Many of these Protax degraders are quite, getting quite advanced in clinical development um, at a large number of different co uh, companies, some of which, you know, Chimera and Arvinus in particular, um, you know, have been founded on this principle. And so it's really um, a burgeoning field. You can see here that, that there's a number of different targets, mostly in, in cancer field, as I mentioned, uh, with different indications. And then the E3 ligase, the warhead, almost all of them so far have been in the Cerebron um, family. But uh, VHL, as I mentioned, is, is also being pursued as well. And so it, it's, like I said, it's, it's a huge burgeoning field in, in drug discovery and development, as well as in chemical biology to develop novel methods of this kind of um, concept, which our second speaker, Amit Chowdhury, will tell us about another, a great example of, of such clever uses of, of this con these concepts. Now, lest you think, well, this is great, but these are all chemists. They know how to make these compounds. I don't have that in my lab. Um, I do want to point out that there is a, a, a new system, well, system that was developed about five years ago called the DTAG system. And this is a, a, a strong thing, and it's actually commercially available, that enables target validation of 
degrading of protein of interest before you then try to find a small molecule. So if you have an interest in, well, you know, I think it would be great if we could inhibit this particular protein and well, maybe it would be great to degrade that protein. You can use the DTAG system to test that in your own, uh, own, your own lab. And the way that works is you have your protein of interest, the target you might want to validate, and expressed as a fusion protein with a mutant FKBP12. We'll talk about FKBP12 a little bit more later. Um, this enables the binding of a single compound in this, uh, from Tokris, it's called DTAG, but there are several compounds that are available that are known to bind to the mutant FKBP12, as well as uh, a particular E3 ligase. And that enables degradation of your protein of interest without having to discover and develop a whole new small molecule. You can use the commercially available DTAG. And then you can um, you know, express this in your own cell lines, treat with DTAG and then determine, is this having the effect that I expect or, or desire? And if it does, then you can really have some confidence going forward. Oh, maybe we need to identify a ProTAC for this purpose. Okay. I taught, this is all the ProTAC field. It's, it's been about 20 years old, but um, I think it's, it's worthwhile to take even a little bit further back step in history to the, the 1990s. And think about the fact that, that Protax leveraged the concept of induced proximity. And this is a, a process that's, that's thought about, a concept that's thought about quite a lot in, in organic chemistry. And it turns out that, that when we think about it, nature really abounds with examples of proximity. Um, growth factors that bind to their receptor on the surface of, of cells bring together dimers, for example. It's a dimerizer. Okay, and that causes you know, um, signal transduction and gene expression. There is a, a great review in Cell from 2021 from Stuart Schreiber that goes over not just these concepts, but the idea of molecular glues, which we'll get to in a second. Other examples where in nature of, of induced proximity include um, the immune response. An antigenic peptide can form a complex between a presenter protein and the T cell receptor, which results in downstream differentiation and expansion and, and effector uh, functions. So um, these things are happening in, in nature. This is not, uh, not too much science fiction, actually. And it turns out there are other small molecule molecular glues that, that have very similar effects to the protex that we talked about. So auxin, as an example, is a plant hormone. Look at how simple this compound is um, from, from a chemist perspective. It's, it's, it's tiny. But what it does is it binds to the uh, tier one ubiquitin ligase and causes the degradation of some cognate transcription factors in plants, plant cells, by forming, uh, by you acting as a molecular glue to bring two proteins together. And I think that's a great segue for us. And in the last few minutes, I'll talk about what is induced proximity by a molecular glue. You might think of uh, a protein having uh, an interaction with a partner in a cell. We all think about that all the time. Protein A and protein B, for example, have a classical protein-protein interaction in a cell. A molecular glue is something that binds to protein A and causes a, a new, the formation of a new surface on that, that protein that enables binding to neosubstrates. So the idea here would be that protein A and protein C don't normally interact. And for example, this glue might not bind to protein C alone, but that by binding this molecular glue to protein A, a new surface is formed that enables this interaction with protein C. And that's really the concept about, uh, that we think of as what's a molecular glue. In the 1990s, there, was, there were many papers that came out uh, that, that discovered that the, the mechanism of action of several natural product immunosuppressants that were becoming very, um, very, uh, characterized and very lots of interest in them uh, turned out to be molecular glues. 
cyclosporin, FK506, which we talked about a little earlier, and, and rapamycin. So all three of these small molecules form molecular glues by binding to different partners to in, induce immunosuppression. In the case of cyclosporin, it binds to a protein called cyclophilin, which then recruits calcineurin phosphatase to have its effect in T cells. FK506 binds to FKBB12 and similarly recruits calcineurin as well. And then finally, uh, rapamycin binds FKBB12 as well and recruits uh, a domain of mTOR, which you probably all heard of, to inhibit its activity. So these compounds uh, induce new interactions and that, that would not normally be uh, present. For example, cyclophilin and calcineurin do not normally uh, interact in a cell. So these are, these are examples of natural product molecular glues that were, were discovered. Upon that discovery, it was thought, well, can we induce proximity by bringing you know, proteins together that might not or normally interact? And to that end, um, FK1012 was synthesized. This is actually two copies of, well, two molecules rather, of FK506 called FK1012. This linker, olefin metathesis chemistry was used to, to allow the linking of these two molecules. And that's represented here in this dumbbell in black. So this FK1012 can cause a protein of interest to uh, have induced proximity when it's expressed as a, a, a fusion protein with FKBB12. And it turns out, as we think, uh, you know, thinking about, you know, the literature and whatnot, the panic attack mouse model of beta cell ablation works precisely in this manner. And this has been published a few times um, over the last several years. Uh, it's got some interest in, in terms of understanding beta cell uh, regeneration. So the rat insulin promoter drives a fusion of caspase 8 with FKBB12. When you use a dimerizer, so this is instead of FK1012, it's a related compound that actually works in a very similar fashion, um, allows the dimerization of these caspase uh, uh, proteins. And in the beta cell, you have then ablation of, of the, the, the cells themselves. And, and this is low dose versus high dose treatment with AP20187. And you can see that these um, islets are much depleted in beta cells. And that enables you to then study, you know, other things that, that might cause regeneration or, you know, what happens when you ablate a beta cell. So these, these molecules, the, the point here is that um, have great relevance to all of our work in, in HERN and in the diabetes field, as well as in, uh, in chemical biology. So with that, I'm gonna uh, translate, tra uh, transfer over to, to Amit, Chowdhury and, and hand the baton over to him, but I want to just leave you with this idea, and this is a, a recent review that, that's very um, helpful in terms of thinking about beyond degradation. And we talked about protax cause uh, protein degradation by recruiting E3 ligase. There's tons of work now in all different areas, and one of the first that emerged was uh, Amit's work on FIX, which is induced phosphorylation. And so I think that's that's going to be a great, um, great talk from him in a moment. But I want to take a, a break here and I'm going to stop my share and see if we have uh, questions because I know, uh, you know, that's it's a fast review of the field and it's a large field. So um, it might be worthwhile just to take a few minutes to take questions. And I see Al has his hand raised already. Thank you. Yeah, that was great. Thank you very much, Bridget. So going back to the protein degradation, and you said it could be an iterative process and going back. So once the protein is deleted, uh, that there would be transcription to try to replace that. And so what's the duration of the effect of this? Oh, yeah. No, I mean, that's a great question. Amit, mean, do, you, do you happen to know the duration? <laughs> you might have a better sense. Yeah, you know, the it's so it's quite persistent. So a lot of protax you will see they will start to degrade within like thirty minutes, and you see essentially a complete knockout. Now, once you remove the drug, 
uh, you know, if you're implying that, you know, the, the protein will come back and that's that's true that the protein will come back. Yeah. It's it's a temporal control. Uh, I am trying to think. So we have done a lot of Cas9 degradation, the CRISPR enzymes, and uh, at really low concentrations, the proteins do do get degraded for very long. I mean, they're, they're gone for a long time. It's yeah. longer than you might imagine, right? Yeah. But, yeah. but what's the duration? So as long as the drug is there or the compound is there, it will continue to be degraded. But is there a duration of, of the compound or the small molecule? Um, well, some of that will depend on the molecule itself and the PK properties of that molecule. And I'm sure, you know, that table that I showed with all the different uh, phases of development, they're probably all different in terms of their administration and timing. So, um, yeah. Thank you. I see that there's a, a few people that have unmuted themselves. Does somebody want to ask uh, another question? Uh, Bridget, maybe I can ask you a question. Um, sure. So the uh, the warhead that you described, thank you for because I because I don't know about this this technology. Um, do you need a targeting system? You know, you were referring to the proximity principle. How do the how do the protex work? Can you are are we at a place where we can say we want to target certain cells in in the body, or are we not there yet? Would you would you tell me a little bit more about that? Yeah. Yeah, so I, I think, no, that's a good question. I think that's maybe a separate issue of the, the targeting of cells. I see. Okay. Yeah. But the uh, the idea of a warhead, you know, and we show an example of, yeah, lenalidomide that can be used or thalidomide, you know, whatever, to, to recruit an E3 ligase. And you're going to hear from Amit, you can swap that out and recruit something else. And I see. Okay. Yeah, okay. Got it. Got it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Um, Inez, it looks like you have a question. Yes, I do have a question. I was curious about, um, you, you mentioned how the compensatory effect that small molecule inhibitors often have on, on proteins, uh, like they are the, there is an increase in, in expression of this protein. And I'm, I'm curious about why the product don't have that effect. Oh, because the target itself is, is actually degraded. So mm -hmm. even, you know, even though there might be, you know, compensatory transcription, and I think this is maybe what L was getting at a little bit too, the, for the duration question, um, the compound's still there. So even if it's made a, a new protein, it gets degraded. Mm -hmm. So in general, transcription is quite slow process, right? And, and the small molecule action is incredibly fast. And so that's what the protag is taking advantage of. You add it in a cell, it kind of like overpowers the transcription in some way, like the rate. And, and then you get a rapid degradation. So you will see compounds which will degrade a protein in like 10 minutes. So by the time the transcription is catching up, the protein is just degraded. And that that's basically the, you know, taking advantage of the small molecules which rapidly diffuse into cells and degrade the target. Uh, Thank you. Thank you. Wei Zheng. Yeah, I have a question about this uh, for tag because you have a link and a small molecule. Is it like a big, become larger? Would it be difficult to penetrate cell? Is that a challenge or not? Because oh, small molecule is it can tuck the enzyme inside the cell, right? But when you add a link, like sometimes the size of link may present a problem, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and there are even... Um, so there's one, I think it was in science, there's a paper that's that's studying how some of these large molecules get into cells and okay. they, some of them even hijack, you know, transporters to get into the cell um, specifically. So yeah, it's a big challenge. And I think, you know, if we think about molecular glues, molecular glues is kind of the umbrella term, can have a linker or not a linker. Right, and the linker ones the category includes Protex, Fix, we'll hear about as well. Um, there is a lot of interest also in discovering, you know, de novo compounds without linkers that, that act as glues on their own, because even something like we saw with auxin, very small compound, um, that would have no problem getting into cells, yeah. Thank you. Um, okay. Bridget, uh, there is a question from Sarah Richardson. She can't ask it in, in person, sure. but um, she's asking about 
Uh, has anyone looked at peptide presentation on, I guess that's the HLA on Protec treated cells? Um, oh. So, so for example, it says, I don't know if you can see that, will, will it yeah, make yeah, tumor yeah. cells more immunogenic? Interesting. I'd have to think about that one myself. I don't, I don't know if there's literature around that. Do you know, Amit? Yeah, there, there, so there is this couple of papers, you know, so just sorry, I, uh, it, I and you will see a little bit of Sarah in, in my talk, we have been following, so that's how I, I have seen some work. Um, so uh, Protax, uh, they, there is a certain surge in the, uh, because there is a rapid degradation, so the peptide loading does increase for some targets, this is one or two papers in that. But in general, the the companies are not as much concerned about immunogenicity. Uh, the there is another parallel technology called Litax, which sucks the protein from outside and it goes through the endosomes and lysosomes. And there, there's some people claim that it's a lot more possible that there'll be a uh, more display of the neo uh, neopeptides. Uh, mm -hmm. That's so much so for the cytosolic degradation, uh, you know, because again, the displays are in, intimately tied to these compartmentalized uh, processes. Um, so, yeah, there are some papers about uh, display of, uh, you know, of the proteins. Uh, and, but the concern or have been mostly been talked in the con in the context of LITEX. Again, I'm not an expert. Uh, I, I'm happy to forward you the papers. Uh, you know, I, I don't know much of immunology, so uh, that's just my uh, brief reading of the literature. And review. Thank you. Amit, would you like to share your screen now and um, get into the kind of the second half of the of the talk? Okay, thanks, John. Uh, Amit, you're oh. sharing. You shared the wrong screen. <laughs> I'm sharing the wrong screen. Yeah, okay. try it again. Oh, oh, it went away. It went away, I think. Yeah. Is this the right screen now? Or there is yeah, it. that's the screen. Yeah, we can see that one. Okay. Uh, wow, Bridge, that was... Swap it. Yeah, there. there you go. Terrific. Perfect. Uh, that was a you know, fantastic overview. And you will see that uh, you know, a lot of those concepts will repeat in my presentation. Uh, but before I, you know, I have to, my institution requires me to uh, disclose my conflicts. Uh, I'm a, a scientific founder of Fortis and all the phosphorylation inducing chimeric small molecules work has been licensed to this company. I'll be talking uh, briefly about some of the CRISPR technologies which uh, have been licensed to uh, editors and uh, none of these other consultants are relevant uh, to the work that I'm going to present. Um, I'll start with acknowledgments. I often miss uh, pointing out there at the end. So the the you know these folks are really you know have been critical for work, and so the acknowledgments will be at the bottom of the the slide. Um, and so um, I want to give a brief overview of what my lab does. So my lab has basically three parts. Fundamentally, we are technology developers, and uh, and we develop technologies inspired by problems. Uh, uh, in beta cell biology. So basically work really closely with Bridget's group and Rohit's group. Um, and so we build um, uh, genome editing technologies uh, and, and then I'll talk about some of the beta cell biology, but today's talk uh, will be primarily be focusing on protein editing. Uh, and so just to give a sense of what we have been up to regarding the genome editing. So we build these kind of controllers, uh, small molecule or light based, which allows us to essentially dial down or up the activity of genome editing systems, the specificity, specificity and so on. And so uh, what we have is a suite of uh, a collection of uh, you know, molecules uh, with different activities, either to uh, a, a inhibit uh, CRISPR systems to degrade them uh, and by protac kind of an approach or molecular glue approach that Bridget just described, and also systems to switch on uh, CRISPR-based technologies. Um, some of you may remember us uh, from our uh, previous HUN participation. We also build delivery technologies. So this was a three-year uh, mandate to build these zinc-based delivery systems. So these are all published, um, so I will not talk about them. 
Uh, but I, I want to get to uh, the two areas of my uh, presentation. The first one is uh, what we're calling it as a phosphorylation inducing chimeric small molecules or fix for inducing phosphorylation. And if time permits, I will you know, give examples of how these same bifunctional molecules can be used to recruit a T cell, for example, to a cancer cell or the complement system uh, to say a bacterial pathogen like Pseudomonas. Um, so I will start by this phosphorylation inducing chimeric small molecule. And, and so uh, just to give you a high level overview of why what we are thinking here. And so you're familiar with the flow of information from DNA to RNA, and then it goes to the protein. Um, but the flow of information doesn't stop here. Uh, proteins, there are tons of writer enzymes which add a post-translational modification like a phosphorylation. Uh, there are erasers like phosphatases, for example, if you remove those PTMs and there are readers. Uh, and so protein in, in a sense undergoes a lot of editing. And while CRISPR-based technologies have really revolutionized editing of DNA and RNA, uh, the technologies for editing these PTMs are still like in their very early stages, although you know they can be really uh, uh, powerful, both in basic research and in medicine. And so while there were several motivations to develop these kind of protein editors or PTM editors, uh, we were kind of like inspired to get into the field primarily again from the beta cell biology. Uh, and, and, and so from reading some of the literature in the field, uh, it seems like still it is unclear what drives the autoimmune attack and the killing of these beta cells. And there, there's some hypotheses that uh, the, there are these neo PTMs which get added to some very specific proteins in the beta cell that causes some new uh, peptides being displayed, and that's triggering this conversion of self to non self. And so the idea was that so here is the list of the PTMs that you can look up on the literature, and, and these are the list of the autoantigens. So the idea, at least conceptually in our head, was that. If we make a library of these PTM editors for these very specific uh, autoantigens and do a kind of a phenotypic screen uh, for beta cells and alpha cells, one can potentially start to get to the molecular basis of autoimmunity. And it, it kind of like is inspired by work of Shinya Yamanaka, who also kind of did a phenotypic screen to identify uh, uh, the key transcription factors involved uh, in induction of pluripotency. So that was one of the uh, uh, motivations. Uh, the second motivation is, you know, as John said, we are a little bit uh, translational. And so insulin, while it is a great uh, uh, you know, a drug, uh, there are issues associated with the biologic nature of insulin. So it's quite expensive and most diabetics live in low and middle income countries. It can cost like roughly 20% of a household income. And the second thing is that you have to constantly prick yourself uh, with insulin because it's biologic nature. And so we thought that maybe if you build a small molecule analog of insulin, which will be orally bioavailable, that would be great. Now, if you look at insulin signaling, you know, and, and Bridget pointed it out, it's insulin binds and it's basically a phosphorylation cascade. So if we can selectively induce phosphorylation on the insulin receptor, uh, you may using some of these small molecule, uh, you know, um, uh, uh, bifunctional molecules, then one may have a orally available insulin analog. And it can also, those kind of editors uh, may also allow us to basically understand the complexity of insulin signaling. The third motivation was again going after these untruggable targets. So we were working on developing inhibitors for these CRISPR enzymes. I showed some example. And the first set of inhibitors we published were really kind of lousy. And it was really hard to kind of uh, um, you know inhibit uh, these enzymes. And so uh, it's 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 well known in the field. These are what you know Bridget was calling it as not yet druggable or you know chemically intractable, and it's the hallmark of DNA binding proteins. These transcription factors have the same kind of issues is that, uh, so these DNA binding proteins have these positively charged DNA binding domains, which they interact with the negatively charged DNA. And, and, and that they have this really tight affinity, which kind of like is really hard to disrupt with a small molecule. And so the idea was that if you look at phosphorylation, for example, or a lot of the PTMs, what they do is that they drop a dense negative charge onto the, onto the protein. So the idea was that can we drop 
you know, if you phosphorylate, say, a transcription factor uh, in its DNA binding domain, will that hurt its ability to bind to DNA? And can that be a way to go after these un so called undruggable proteins? Now, we haven't gotten there, but we have managed to have some kind of effect on KRAS and another oncogenic protein, which interacts with these GTP. So there is also this charge charge interaction. And uh, not only with GTP, but also with the membrane. And so I'll provide some data to that effect in a bit. So uh, I will not talk about the platform, how we build these molecules, and then I will talk about the bioactivities of these uh, uh, molecules. And so the, the, the classic design is started with the dumbbell uh, that Bridget described. Uh, you have these squares, which will bind to, say, the kinase, and you have the hexagon, which will bind to the target protein. There'll be a ternary complex, and that will lead to the phosphorylation of the target. And so it, we started with AMPK as a first with this uh, small molecule um, that was described or discovered by Mark. Uh, for some other protein, like a protein kinase C, we had to adopt a slightly different approach. Uh, so protein kinase C, the way it works is that it has the C1 domain, and there are these ligands which bind uh, to the C1 domain. And these ligands have this lipid tail. So it basically allows PKC to translocate to the membrane. And so that then phosphorylates its uh, you know, a native substrate. So that's how it works in an endogenous system. And so what we did here is that we took these ligands and instead of this lipid tail, we put a hydrophilic tail like a peg, which will prevent it from inserting into the membrane. And at the end of the tail, we attach a target binder. So essentially this allowed us to make PKC work in the cytosol and then and, and take this protein kinase and phosphorylate a given target uh, you know, at a given site. So those were the early design principles. Do these design principles do really work? And so I'll give you some, uh, you know, some data to that effect. So I know we we go with this notion of lock and key, and there is a specific pairing between a kinase and its substrate. So can you really rewire uh, the specificity of the kinase with these uh, bifunctional small molecules? And so over here, what you're looking at is a protein kinase C. And BRD4 is a uh, target which is not phosphorylated by protein kinase C. And so using this bifunctional molecule, which we're calling as FIX, uh, we see a nice phosphorylation on the target uh, BRD4. And so in order to further confirm that we are indeed rewiring the specificity of the kinase, what we did is that we took the C1 domain, which is present in PKC, which binds to the ligand, we grafted it to another kinase. In this case, this is an ABL kinase, it's a tyrosine kinase. And we see a nice phosphorylation in the fix, but not with the control. So that kind of like suggested that, yeah, indeed we can make these bifunctional molecules that can rewire the specificity of the kinase. and and um, and you know, and we can see the phosphorylation on a neo substrate. Uh, substrate. Uh, you know, I think Bridget already talked about it. Uh, the about the classical pharmacology, where an inhibitor is essentially stoichiometric, and in case of these bifunctional molecules, they're catalytic. And so, I will not go in great detail to show that we see the same thing. So, the small molecule phosphorylates a target, then it you know leaves, and then it does the same thing with the other target. And so, that is shown in the ATP production, which far exceeds the concentration of the kinase. Um, the third uh, hallmark of these bifunctional molecules is the dose. So again, in a classical pharmacology and in inhibitor, you have this monotonically increasing dose that plateaus. Uh, these bifunctional molecules exhibit what is called as a hook effect, which is, you know, as you increase the dose of the compound, you see an increasing effect, but then it plateaus and then it drops off sharply. And, and that happens because uh, at the plat at the peak of this, we have these ternary complexes, the three-body equilibrium. But if you go higher in concentration, the binary equilibrium, which is the binding to each of the individual components, they dominate the equilibrium. And that's why you see this kind of a, a drop in the signal. Okay, so what I told you so far, uh, this this dumbbell design. It uh, is great starting point, but it doesn't really scale up. And the reason why it doesn't scale up, you know, this vision that, you know, I outlined initially that uh, we want to do are able to write PTMs on any as in, in any uh, given protein of interest using, a, you know, a long list of PTM inducing enzymes. It doesn't scale up because these squares that I'm talking about for say a given uh, enzyme, the squares are not, uh, you know, they have this very uh, uh, important properties. So first, they cannot be an inhibitor. 
And the second, they have to be allosteric and they have to have high affinity. And so they're quite limited. And so that is kind of a rate limiting and does not prevent scaling up of this conventional design. And so you, one can go about screening these uh, uh, you know, and trying to identify this, and I know uh, that's I think is a, is a you know one great way to go after it. But we were essentially looking for something more of a uh, you know a, a shortcut. And as you know, uh, you know, and as Bridget also pointed out, uh, there are so many inhibitors available. So you know, for example, if you look at the kinase itself, and this is just a list of handful of the clinically approved inhibitors. Uh, you can find enzyme inhibitors for pretty much any enzyme. And so the question is, can we use existing chemical matter in, you know, in, in, instead of doing a screening? And so we, we came up with a, a, a kind of a new design of a, uh, or a different design of bifunctional, which can use the inhibitors of the enzyme. And so the way these bifunctionals are, they're again like dumbbells, but the linker part, which was previously kind of just connecting the two ends has a function. And the way it works is that, so when the inhibitor say binds to your target protein, there's usually a reactive group. And what that reactive group on the protein, which could be a cysteine or a lysine, and what that does is that it splits the molecule in such a way that the inhibitor gets kicked out, but you essentially tag a small percentage of the enzyme uh, with your target binder. And that target binder can then use proximity and add a PTM. And so uh, the, the question is, does this approach work? Uh, and, and so I'll give you some example with a, uh, you know, one kind is, but we have done it at least like 10 or 12 times and we can make the system work. And so the way it works here is you're taking a Bruton tyrosine kinase and, and this kinase here, red triangle is ibrutinib. It's a known drug uh, for this kinase. And so we basically took a known drug and we basically attached this kind of a cleavable linker that I told you. And in this here, the cysteine reacts. It essentially kicks out the, or splits the molecule. The inhibitor gets kicked out. We tag with the target binder, which in this case is JQ1, binds to this target protein BRD4. And you know that then induces phosphorylation, which we can measure very nicely uh, using immunoblotting. And so uh, uh, to just to show you and to convince you that uh, this is on target, that this mechanism holds true in cells, we use this assay, which has been developed by Promega, where you know we start with the inhibitor and the inhibitor does the tagging. Now the pocket, uh, if, our, uh, if the inhibitor is still sticking in the pocket, then this probe, which has got a fluorophore will not bind. And so this uh, this probe over here essentially has got a fluorophore which can form bread pair with a luciferase on the kinase. And so if the inhibitor is still stuck in the pocket, then you will not be able to see any bread. And so we use this acid to essentially confirm that while these, you know, the inhibitors really occupy the pocket, the concentration region where we are operating, which is hundreds of nanomolar, uh, these new compounds, they don't. So at a very high concentration, which is tens of micromolar, you see this effect of, of occupancy, but on the concentration region where we are operating, we don't see any kind of uh, the, you know, uh, the occupancy of the pocket allowing us to essentially the kinase do the phosphorylation. And so we have done this for a lot of targets. So we, we basically can reproduce this. And I, now we think that we can really scale up uh, um, and start building these kind of a PTM writing chimeras for a whole set of PTM inducing enzymes, as well as to remove a PTM. So if you want to say remove a phosphatase uh, for, in a phosphoryl group, I think we can also start to do that. Um, so that is all about the platform development. I'm going to now walk you through some of the biological activities that uh, uh, you know we have confirmed using these bifunctional molecules. And the first one is, is again, a very classic in the field, which is receptor to tyrosine signaling, kind of what insulin does. So you have a, uh, a ligand that binds to this receptor tyrosine kinase, the oligomerize, and there is a transcriptional activation. And so what we did is that we made fix which will essentially recruit a kinase and that will phosphorylate it and that can switch on uh, the, uh, the, the signal uh, transduction. And so we see a nice phosphorylation on EGFR, induction of the phosphorylation. And using the luciferase uh, reporter assay, we also see a nice switching on of the transcription indicating that we can indeed uh, induce a phosphorylation and see the downstream effect. 
Um, we have also looked into a different kind of a phosphorylation. Now, this one is uh, associated with phase separation. And so Liprin uh, is one of those uh, you know, neuronal proteins, which when it undergoes phosphorylation, forms this phase separated condensate. Uh, and that is quite critical for these neuronal uh, functions. And so again, we, we took Liprin. Uh, we, have, we made a, you know, basically a fixed molecule to induce the phosphorylation. And you see a nice... Uh, you know, the phase operation over here. So the green is basically the Liprin with GFP tag or and Venus tag, and we see night condensate formation in a dose-dependent fashion, as well as in a rapid um, uh, fashion. Uh, the third uh, bioactivity of uh, uh, FIX, uh, you know, we will, uh, you know, it's it's about sequestration. So these uh, protein called 1433 essentially uh, binds to a phosphorylation size and it can sequester uh, the given protein. So we, you know, we started with the BCR level and oncogenic protein and its sequestration. So we see a nice phosphorylation and the sequestration leads to killing of these uh, CML uh, lines. So, so far, what I've told you is all about naturally occurring phosphorylation. Uh, can we put neophosphorylations? Phosphorylations with cells have typically not seen before. And what impact does that have? And so again, with the BCR able, what we have done is that we have dimerized two of them and it turns out they phosphorylate each other. The phosphorylation lands right in the ATP binding pocket, messes with the ATP binding, and that again leads to killing of the CML lines much more with a much higher potency uh, than a known drug. Uh, we have essentially repeated this multiple times. So we have seen the same effect uh, with brute, uh, you know, the BTK, but in this case, the kinase is PKC. Again, the phosphorylation lands in the ATP binding pocket. It prevents ATP binding. And then in finally, with the KRAS, uh, we see the same thing where we phosphorylate, we see a nice uh, phosphorylation band, lands in the GTP binding pocket, and we see a drop in the signaling. And so what I'm trying to get here is that, uh, you know, with the careful design of the linker, one can induce a naturally occurring phosphorylation and see a downstream biology. But if you change the linker or if you alter the kind of kinase you're recruiting, you can add a neo-PTM and that also has a lot of interesting activities. And so just to kind of like summarize, uh, we have built uh, you know, a two platforms uh, uh, for uh, inducing phosphorylation. And I talked about uh, various natural as well as the neophosphorylation. Now in a last minute or so, I'm going to very quickly tell you about some of the new areas. So this is, you know, this is, these are relatively old work. Uh, we'll, I will tell, tell you about a little bit about T cell recruitment, uh, leveraging this kind of a group transfer chemistry that I talked about. So uh, I, I mentioned to you that we have built this linker, which allows to essentially attach a cargo, you know, kind of a, a display a group on your target protein. And if you remember, there is the Nobel Prize in the chemistry was given to this bioorthogonal chemistry, and it basically allows to two groups to come together and essentially click or uh, you know, they form a covalent bond with each other. And so leveraging these two, uh, what we have essentially built is, is a kind of a, a set of molecules uh, where if we attach your target binder, in this case, this will be an oncogenic target, uh, say for example, Keras G12C, which is expressed only in cancer cells, that goes through the processing and then there is a display uh, on MHC of those that particular group. And then using click chemistry, we essentially bring a T cell binder. And so what we have seen for multiple targets is essentially T cell recruitment and T cell activation uh, using clinically approved inhibitors. So we start with the clinically approved inhibitors. We attach this group, which essentially leads to uh, forcing of the proximity between T cell and the cancer cell. Um, I'll, I'll, I'll end with one last uh, uh, in our project about complement recruitment. So this is in the antimicrobial space. We're working very closely with Bridget's group here. Um, and so here, this is, you know, a complement system is a natural way with, by which fights the uh, bacterial pathogens. And this complement system basically drill holes 
uh, into uh, into the bacterial through these membrane attack complexes. And so I will not go into great detail. The papers will be coming out. So it's a, it's a collaboration uh, with large and you know, multiple PIs. We have essentially built six different types of molecules, and I will show some bioactivities of these. So what you're looking here in the green spec is a pseudomonas, you know, a terrible bacterial pathogen. And so that pseudomonas in the presence of just this bifunctional dumbbell molecules doesn't do anything. But the moment you add, say, a human serum, which has complement, these cells start to burst, uh, you know, kind of like suggesting that the, you know, the, the bifunctional molecules uh, are, are, are actually driving or increasing the complement concentration on these bacterial and then getting this unusual activity. So that's what we observe over here in terms of the growth. Uh, again, if you denature or heat denature the complement, you don't see the effect. If you add a complement inhibitor, you don't see the growth inhibition. So it's a kind of a complement dependent uh, pathway. And so uh, the one major advantage we are seeing with this approach is that in addition to you know, killing bacteria selectively, uh, these so-called anti-infectives, at least in the early studies, they're not very harmful to the kidney, which is you know, the nephrotoxicity is a common failure mode for a lot of these antibacterials. So that's a big advantage of this approach. I get, I hope you'll have to do more uh, experiments to prove it, but that's the early data looks interesting. So so with that, I would like to thank the group, the, the people highlighted here with some of the key uh, drivers for the phosphorylation project started originally by, uh, by an undergraduate and then and, and Peng Wu. And, and then so and I'm thankful to my collaborators and the funding agency. Uh, and thank you all to uh, for listening. Thank you very much. Annette. That was terrific. Lots of work going on there. Yeah, I agree, Bridget. <laughs> and a good hand clap. Um, are there any questions uh, for a minute? I see we still have a, a few more minutes. If you do, you can take yourself off uh, mute. And I'm looking in the chat to see if there are any questions uh, there. I don't see any coming in. Admit that uh, that was a pretty clever idea to have these uh, cleavable linkers. I thought that was that was really interesting. And, and so as you started to show kind of how you were using those, I started to think about CAR Ts, um, and and so that 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 must be something that uh, you've I guess maybe compared or, or or thought about. I'm curious about what applications you see this using in that could not be used. In other words, what advantages does this cleavable linker give you over a, a technology like that? I guess you have a slide ready for that. Yeah, I, I was just, you know, <laughs> no, this is good. I mean, you know, we, we, are, uh, you know, we are talking about starting another company in this space. And the, the idea here, and, and we are not the only one, uh, you know, uh, some of the groups have also worked in this. So the idea is to take something like, you know, uh, molecules for which patients have already kind of developed resistance a little bit. Uh -huh. and so essentially the, and, and so the idea is that take those clinically approved molecules where there is some efficacy and display these groups and then add this uh, basically a T-cell recruiter. Uh, and so basically, you know, the patients who have already fixed dose and uh, of a given known clinical molecule, uh, just add this kind of a group to it and then follow it up with this T-cell recruiter to essentially kill those cancer cells. So that's like the, the area where we are thinking of operating. Um, and, and, you know, there are lots of patients with, in, you know, resistance to either KRAS inhibitors, FGFR, BDK, and so on. So, uh, you know, and so that's, that's roughly one of the areas we are focusing on. Terrific. And I see that, uh, Sarah, um, you have some interest in reaching out. Thank you very much, Bridget, for including uh, both you and Amit's uh, email address there. And uh, you can, re if you didn't catch it here, uh, you can reach out to us and we can certainly put you in contact with either one of them. We're at the top of the hour. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have time for any more questions, but this has been really great. This is technology I was not, I don't really know that much about, and you both made it really accessible to understand. So I think on behalf of everyone, thank you very much. And um, stay tuned and next month. I think we'll have an, uh, another talk soon. Thank you guys right. for your time. Thank you. Okay, bye everyone.